On a glorious summer day, when I was about 14, 15 years old, that one of those last summers before entering the realm of work, I, uh, it was a glorious summer day, blue sky, the sun was uh, shining, the wind was blowing. I was inside reading a book. I know, surprise. But uh, that's where I find myself that day. I had ridden up to the library, as I had done so often for so many years, and I'd brought a book home. My local library growing up in Shorewood, um, it was probably about four times the size of the library we have here. It's a, a fairly large library, I guess. And after reading in that library for about a decade, I had read the library. Right? I had read all the fantasy, all the fiction, all the science fiction, everything. I started to dabble in biography and history because I was just running out of things to read. And uh, it was tra just tragedy, I know. Um, and so I, I, what I'd done that day is what I'd started to do uh, is I'd go and I'd just look at the new uh, purchases, the new bookshelf. And, and uh, I would just look and see if there was any book that caught my eye. And, and I'd read the, the weirdest things. I read a history of the Corvette because of an interesting spine. And so I don't know much about cars, but I know a lot about the Corvettes. Uh, and there was a book that caught my eye that day. And I was looking forward to taking it home and just reading it. That was my, uh, I, I, my perfect Saturday was to find a trilogy I hadn't read and just read the trilogy. Some people binge watch movies, I binge read books. And, and so I, I, I'd gotten lucky and I'd found a book I had not read on the new purchases and I brought it home and, and I cracked it open and I started reading and about three chapters in I thought to myself, wait a minute, I recognize this. I know this author. In my excitement to just find a new book to read, I had looked at the cover, or at the spine, I had looked at the back and read the description. I hadn't actually looked at the cover to see who wrote the book. I got home, I got three chapters in, and I thought to myself, this, this is, I know this author, this is Anne McCaffrey. And I was right. It was one of those weird moments where uh, it's kind of a, a dork pride that I don't brag about often, but I'd read so much of her work that I, I knew her work even if you didn't tell me. It was, I, I knew who that author was. I could recognize it based on the style. It's one of those things we have these moments on occasions. Well, you ever flip through radio stations and you hear a new song, you, you catch it halfway through and you know who sang it before you get to the end of it? Right, you have that moment, or, or you start. You look at a piece of art, and you look at that and say, that's so-and-so, that's and, -so. and, and you're right, even though you don't know. The same thing happened to me with, with this author. That, that's, that's Anne McCaffrey. Um, that happened to me this week as I was sitting down to prepare for worship, as I was preparing for this sermon. I, I sat down to read James, and um, what I do when I start reading a book um, I knew I needed, to, I just wanted to preach a book of the Bible. After spending 10 weeks on the Sermon on the Mount, I wanted to pre preach a book of the Bible. And I opened my Bible, and I got a blank sheet of paper, and I thought, here we go. A and, and if I read a book, a chapter of the Bible, I just start writing down questions. And one of those questions is, is a sermon. I just don't know which one yet. And I, I would get to, I read a, a chunk of James, and I'd look at the paper and think, I've covered that already. And I'd read a little bit more of James, and I'd look at the paper and think, nope, still no questions. I've just covered all of that just now in the Sermon on the Mount. I read the book of James, and uh, every time I'd get to something interesting in the book of James, I'd think, but wait a minute, I just covered that in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I got desperate, and I started looking. And uh, I found an article by a guy named Virgil, Virgil Porter, and the name of the article is The Sermon on the Mount in the Book of James. And I thought, ah, that makes sense. Here, here's what this guy Virgil points out. This is, uh, think about the book of James. James is the half-brother of Jesus, right? So he's the half-brother of Jesus, an early leader in the church. And the, he writes this, this book, this letter, and he writes it to the 12 tribes of Israel. What that tells us is, if he's writing it to all the church, and all the church are all the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes are how you talk about Jews, right? So this is before Gentiles had start, started joining the church. So this means it's written really early. This is one of the earliest letters that we have in the New Testament. So it's written probably in the mid-early 40s. And so he uh, writes this, this letter to all of the people who follow Jesus, and he's not addressing a particular topic, 
right? You know how Paul, when he writes a letter to the church at Corinth, he's writing and saying, keep your pants on, you invite everyone to communion, and, and, and you might want to love each other? I mean, he's addressing specific problems. When he writes to the church at Galatia, at Galatia he's saying, you're not going to do works righteousness. You got to, it's grace, right? Paul writes in response to specific situations. James isn't doing that. He's writing what we call a... Uh, a universal or Catholic letter, it's written to the entire church. James, Jude, Peter, John, they are, they're all letters written to every Christian out there. And so he is, James is right, the half-brother of Jesus, is writing a letter to all the Christians of the church, all the 12 tribes, and it, he's writing to educate people. Because remember, also, the Gospels haven't been written yet. Everyone who's following Jesus is following him based on word of mouth. Mark won't be written till the 60s, Matthew and Luke till the 70s, and John till the 90s. We're still decades away from the, if you, someone wants to follow Jesus, we're still decades away from someone being able to say, here, read the Gospels, right? It's all word of mouth still, except for a few letters that are being kicked around. And so James is writing this letter to tell people about how to follow Jesus. What do you think he's going to write about, right? How many times do you think James had heard the Sermon on the Mount? This is the, in the days before radio, in the days before TV, if a traveling preacher goes around, there's no one to go run ahead of time and like tell him what he's going to say. Jesus probably repeated himself a lot. Right? He probably, the, the Sermon on the Mount is in a sense his best of, and he had given that sermon at every single place he'd stopped. And he'd been preaching for three years, right? So when James sits down to write his letter, how many times has he heard the Sermon on the Mount? Well, he's probably heard it at least twice, right? <laughs> he's heard it a few times. He, he has heard it so many times that he starts to sound like it. I, we're having some technical difficulties this day. I was going to show you, there are 45 places where he uses pretty much the same words as the Sermon on the Mount. Thankfully, our printer still works. So I'm going to give, it, give them to you. Oh. I always need help. This is like a third of the overlaps that happen. But if you start looking and you put, take James and, and the Sermon on the Mount and put them side by side, it, it, Jesus it starts with like, consider all joy my brethren when you, can, you, when you encounter various trials. And how does Jesus begin the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely, falsely say all kind of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad. James, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Jesus, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Prove yourself doers of the word. James, Matthew, everyone who hears these, thing, these words of mine acts on them. James, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew, you shall love your neighbor. James, if however you are fulfilling the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. Matthew, therefore treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. You can go down this. This is just the short version. There are three more pages of overlaps that I could have printed out. But uh, I think you start to see uh, what's going on there. James, teaching the rest of the church about how to live uh, following his half-brother, he hits all the big topics that Jesus hit on the Sermon on the Mount. How the law is fulfilled in Jesus, wealth, poverty, not worrying about daily bread, let your yes be yes, let your no be no, prayer, uh, trials. I mean, G James begins his letter by saying, rejoice when you are persecuted. Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount by saying, uh, blessed are you when you are persecuted. Blessed are you when you are reviled. Temptation, perfection, judgment, it's all covered in both. Right? The Sermon on the Mount in the book of James, it covers all the same topics. Now, it's not immediately apparent because the structure is differently, the order in which some of the topics are addressed are different, but if you, you look at them, it's, it's, it's all there, right? 
And so I was looking at this and I was realizing that Jesus' half-brother James writes this letter to all the Christians as a rehash on the Sermon on the Mount, and that's why I recognized it. I just preached the Sermon on the Mount, I open up the book of James, and no wonder it feels like I know this author. I do. I just spent 10 weeks with him. We just spent 10 weeks with him. And I thought to myself, well, I might just need to skip James for right now because I really hate to repeat myself. I, I think that would be somewhat boring. I don't want to give you the same sermon that you had heard four weeks ago. I just, yeah. I'd be bored, you'd be bored. I, I hate to preach. I never preach a sermon that I'm bored by because there's no way I expect you to stay awake. Um, so I was tempted to skip James, but there are two things that came to mind. First, it's important to notice what James is doing. James is rehashing something he knows really, really well. And we rehash things we know really, really well. You know what's going to happen when we hit to December? We're going to celebrate Advent. You know what happened at the beginning, of, at the end of Advent? Any surprises there? We're going to read the same scripture we've read every Christmas Eve in, all, in your living and my living memory, right? And we're still going to get together and do it. We're going to rehash the same readings, right? What's the value in doing that? Well, I think it's important to look at that because that's what James is doing. He is rehashing the same thing that he had heard many, 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 many times. So I figured we need to look at it for that reason. And second, a practical reason. I, re I figured this out Wednesday night and Thursday that was the beginning of the Bevere homecoming and I didn't have time to start from scratch. <laughs> so we're going to look at what James, how, how do we find some good news when it comes just the idea of rehashing? And I want to ask you a question to start thinking about this. How many sermons do you remember? Like how many sermons do you distinctly remember? Do you remember your wedding sermon? That's a non-rhetorical question. Who here remembers your wedding sermon? Okay. Funerals? Who remembers a funeral sermon distinctly? All right. Baptism? Who remembers a baptism funeral? All right. Who remembers last Easter? Who remembers three months ago on just a regular Sunday? <laughs> I go back and I look at sermons from anything older than about a year. If I open up the sermon, I never re-preach the same sermon, but I'll go back and look at it, because if I figured it out once, I'm going to preach on the same passage. I want to see what I figured out before uh, and just start something new. Um, but I'll go back and if I, if I look at an old sermon, it's like my weird unmet twin wrote something. And I'll start reading a sermon, I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, I, I like this. I, I, I agree with this. It's wonderful. It's like I'm reading something for the first time, right? And if I can't remember my own sermons from over a year ago, I'm not expecting you to either, right? Don't, don't feel bad if you don't remember every single sermon I've ever, I've ever preached. I don't either. <laughs> and I wrote them. We don't remember every sermon. We forget most sermons that we hear. That doesn't mean that we should just give up on sermons. That means we need to understand what they're doing. If you watch my mama cook, and you watch me cook, you're watching the same thing. And it's an amazing thing because I can't tell you, you know how some people have like a signature dish? My mom really doesn't have a signature dish. I can't tell you more than about three meals my mama has ever made. Right, there is a real, she makes a lot of chopped salads lately. She had made a really good pork loin the last time we ate in a house because we ate it at the end of living in that house and it was the first meal we had in the next house. I remember uh, the peppermint frosting she always put on my birthday cakes. Right? But I don't remember, besides that, like two or three specific meals, I don't remember a lot of what my mama cooked. And yet, you know, many of you have seen my spice rack. It's about yay big. And then my mama has a spice rack. She got the big version. You know what they look like? The same, right? They look the exact same. And if I go to my mama's house and we start cooking, you know what we both do? Open the fridge. Well, I got some chicken. I got some fresh asparagus. Huh. And then 30 minutes later, done, right? We both just kind of cook on the fly. I can't tell you exactly how my mama cooks. I can't tell you exactly what my mama cooks, but I can tell you if you watch us both in the kitchen, you're seeing the exact same thing. Right? It's the same thing with sermons. You don't remember every single sermon you've ever heard. You just don't. 
James didn't remember every single sermon. He heard his half-brother preach. And, and Jesus was like, well, Jesus. <laughs> Yet, after hearing, after Jesus, after James heard the Sermon on the Mount again and again and again, after teaching it to people, after using it, after uh, bringing people into the church and using it to help people understand, after about 14 to 18 years of referring back to that same sermon, James starts to sound like Jesus. Right? James starts to sound a lot like Jesus. And so that's what he writes like. When he writes the book of James, James sounds like his brother, just like I cook like my mama. And in that sense, I think sermons matter. Because while there will be a few times you'll hear a sermon, and it will be the sermon that changes your life, right? there's been a few sermons I remember that have changed my life. Two. Right? There are about two sermons that have changed my life. The rest of them, I wouldn't give up any of them. Because they have made me who I am today. It, 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 I've forgotten most of them. Most sermons fade from memory. And, and you'll probably forget this one too. This is a sermon on forgetting sermons, and you'll probably forget it. And that's somewhat amusing and oddly satisfying. And that's okay. We go back over the same passages again and again and again, the same seasons of the church, the same Lord's Prayer, the same creeds. But and because like James hearing Jesus again and again, James starts to live and act and sound just like his brother. Now, we'll be always be looking for new combinations, new ways to come to Scripture, new ways to illuminate Scripture. I would never have figured this out if I had not read the, the Sermon on the Mount right next to James. If, 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 I'd, if I'd read James even next week, I don't know if I would have made this connection. But having read it side by side like this, I mean, I, could, I couldn't but make this connection. And I was looking for those new connections across Scripture, new ways to understand it. But... Um, we're always just going to be rehashing the same scriptures, and that's okay. It's fundamentally good to keep on going back to the same word of God, to trust that there's always more there, and to trust that even if we're forgetting it, it's still making a difference. And so my uh, thing to ask you to do this week is a bit odd. I'm inviting you to forget this sermon tomorrow. Think about it today, but I know you're going to forget it tomorrow. Forget this sermon, but be sure to come back and to listen to the next one. Because it is how we understand that we are transformed. That Sunday after Sunday, as we encounter the Word of God, it changes us. So that, uh, the same way that when I started reading that book and I recognized that author three chapters in, in the same way that you go forth from this place, when people read your lives, they recognize who your author is. Jesus.